And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer into the temple, a teacher turned gamer turned now full on game des now full on game designer with his debut project, Night, a game that asks and answers, will you ride into legend? The one and only Mark Baker. How are you doing today, man? I am doing really well. Really well. And thank you, Gaming Monk. I'm, I'm happy to come to worship at the Temple of Gaming. <laughs> so, I suppose I should... I suppose I'll start at the humble beginnings, in a sense. What... What was your introduction to role-playing games, and what made it stick? Oh, okay, so, um, look, I have to tell the same story that I guess everybody does, in that, um, I, uh, you know, I, I first picked up Dungeon Dragons and that sort of stuff, so, um, but, I mean, earlier on than that, um, I would have been playing some computer games with some role, with a lot of role-playing elements in them, that sort of stuff, back in the, uh, Back in, the, back in the early 90s, that sort of stuff, and then it wouldn't have been until Baldur's Gate 1 uh, that really sort of drove my absolute love of gaming, and that manual there, I, re I remember it clearly, it was this uh, spiral bound sort of thing, and it had all these rules for Advanced Dungeons and Dragons in it, and um, uh, I was so excited about the uh, about, about this concept of doing it, and then um, and and from there, I didn't even realise uh, before that that people played Dungeons and Dragons as such. I, um, coming from Australia and and um, and and going up a little bit um, uh, in the sticks, so to speak. Uh, you know, there isn't a lot of that sort of stuff around. Gaming shops and that sort of stuff back in rural communities just, just aren't there, so you don't see them very much. So, um, with that said, you know, I played Baldur's Gate 1, I came into the cities, started to see that that, that, that sort of stuff was around, and and, um, and, the, and a little, when I was in high school at the time, a little, uh, little box set called The Adventure Begins Here started, and uh, a friend of mine and I, we both uh, went there, we, we pooled our cash together, um, and uh, sitting in the back of a McDonald's, uh, worked out how to play 3rd uh, edition Dungeons and Dragons, where a, uh, I, and I remember it clearly, a... Uh, a little a unicorn had been uh, put to sleep by goblin arrows, uh, which is hilarious because later on, obviously, the unicorns are immune to sleep effects. But you know, you find these things out later on in your career, mm -hmm. and from there, I, I was just uh, completely in love. Yeah. So, <laughs> if I'm looking th looking through the inspired paragraph early, um, right at the top of the Kickstarter page, it mentions a bunch of different games. So I'm guessing you weren't really a one system type. You were somebody who jumped around between different systems over the years. Oh, look, for the first 10 years um, of gaming, I didn't really know there were that many other systems around. Uh, obviously, yeah, Dungeons and Dragons. Um, and occasionally you'd see other things, but my gaming group were never that interested in, in trying other things. So, um, and the third edition stuff came out and uh, and there was a million source books coming out because obviously the, the OGL era um, was strong so we stayed with that for a very very long time but then I, I picked up um, a number I started to pick up a number of other systems um, just uh, because I was curious about them I really like World War Two type stuff and I, saw, I bought this game called Godlike uh, which is a nice little mm -hmm. system um, and it, and it just blew my mind and I thought wow actually oh hang on there's actually more than one system of a Available. Uh, um, and, and from there, you know, it just sort of opened up this whole concept that there are other systems, other games. Um, and it was only in uni, really, that I started to, um, you know, really make a make a big jump into different things. But to be honest with you, it, it probably hasn't been in yeah, 2010 or so, I'd imagine, uh, maybe a little bit earlier, 2005-ish, that um, I really moved away from, from that D20 uh, stuff and I started to explore a, uh, uh, different fields, you know, uh, powered by the apocalypse and stuff like that, and uh, Blades in the Dark, um, and obviously the main the main inspiration for my book, which would have been which was Pendragon, um, which um, is you know is an amazing book unto itself. So um, and then you know from there I just um, you know I had a hole in my pocket and the money just kept falling out and buying me role playing books. Mm -hmm. So. so with that, with that in mind, um, 
there's a there, when it comes to night, there's a bunch of games that you that um you met that you mentioned. But before we even before we even get into that, um, there's a kind of chicken and egg situation that I'd like I like to resolve, and that is. Sure. Was it the was it was was it a when it comes to the origin of the night RPG you're developing was it a ca- was it a case of pulling a what if or were you always a, were you always a fan of um, chivalric lo- of lore um, from from this particular era romantic or otherwise long before that oh uh, long before that long before that I, I, I've always been a um... Uh, when I was a kid, um, I was an avid reader of all sorts of fantasy books, um, and I remember distinctly reading, uh, you know, a number of, of Arthurian tales, um, and uh, I think there was just a whole collection of them, just in, uh, you know, just a collection of different tales in one book that I picked up out of this, uh, this uh, you know, you'd be in school here in Australia, they'd, they'd send around these little pamphlets, right, and uh, what, your par- what your parents would do is they'd, uh, they'd put in money and, um, and they'd send you the book that you pick when you check it off on this little checklist and uh i remember picking my, the the king arthur one so it, it would have been i would have been like uh, you know eight or nine when um when that first so my when that first chivalric sort of stuff came around now when i was thinking about that just the other day and, and talking to you now i um I realised that my first real exposure to fantasy in any way this chivalric romantic stuff mm-hmm. um was actually not through uh, other media, it was actually through King Arthur stories and, and mythological stories, rather than uh, you know, the things that might have inspired other types of D&D, like Tolkien or, or um, well, not that, you know, that's an arguable thing, but you know, that style of gameplay with elves and dwarves and all the rest of that sort of stuff so I was much more inspired by that and there's a there's a series called The, uh, the Black Cauldron um, by um, mm, yeah, can't remember his name off the top of my head. Um, the, the, the Chronicles of Prydane, which were also available, and they had a very similar theme, Welsh background, uh, um, sort of connected um, mythological stuff, um, if in a different, you know, a looser environment. But anyway, so those were my first, um, you know, being brought into the fantasy environment rather than something along the lines of, say, um, I don't know, um, Elric of Melnimone or something like that, or Conan. Mm-hmm. Which came for me a lot later. Yeah. And with that, with that in mind, now that I've got now that I've got that um, est- established, um, mm-hmm. I wouldn't be I wouldn't be surprised if if knights somehow if knights either either on the player or GM side managed to sneak into some of your D and D campaigns at some form. <laughs> um, thinking back, I um uh, uh my, my Dungeons and Dragons um and my RPG gaming um I I remember very clearly that um every every time that we're playing through you know there's always wizards and and uh, and uh, you know that that more um, you know heroic fantasy style in in, in Dungeons and Dragons. Um, but I, I, I always remember when I when I homebrewed adventures and things like that that it it would always feature uh, sort of more oh, medieval is not the right word for it but maybe more chivalric sort of um, you know concepts so there might be you know um, maybe there was a, a you know a, 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 a robber knight who who'd captured someone or or, um, or or concepts of people betraying each other or whatever but I mean back in those days uh, you know we were we were all there to kill the orcs and gather the XP so uh, I guess there was there was some fundamental stuff that had started to come through. But uh, it definitely wasn't until pretty recently, within the past like three years, when Night really came together, that um, and I started to write it up and, and do all the rest of that. That 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 um, strong romantic chivalry aspect sort of came back into my games, and when it came back, it came back extremely strong. So, yeah. Mm-hmm. So, with that with that in mind, there's a few there's a few games that are mentioned. Um, in that in that paragraph I mentioned before, that I'd like to I like to get a feel for your history with that game and kind of what things you took from it when it came to the development of Knight. Um, oh, first, right, sure. first being um, King Arthur Pendragon, which is some interesting timing. Me um, seeing seeing that name, <laughs> given what yes. given what um, what what was announced a few days ago. 
Yeah, well, I'm actually looking forward to that. I, um, uh, you know, uh, my 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 games are a little indie game, um, but um, and and they're they're uh, they're the uh, they're the big granddaddy in the field of Arthurian um, legend and things like that, obviously. Um, and so um, I I, uh, I love Pendragon, and it was actually my reading of I think the fifth edition of um, King Arthur Pendragon that that inspired me to go out and make Knight um, because uh, you know I'm reading through it and I'm reading through its sister book um, Paladin and. Um, uh, I think it's uh, Prince Valiant role playing or something, um, and you know I'm reading through these things and I'm loving what they're doing and I'm reading through the campaign um, and and I'm just realizing to myself that that my gaming style, you know that that's a very traditional uh, role playing. Um, you know, there's a very strong GM role. There's a very strong, uh, you know, the players follow the role, especially if they're in the King Dragon, um, King Arthur Pendragon um, campaign, which is probably, which is absolutely brilliant in, in many ways. And um, I'm absolutely certain they will redo it for sixth edition. And I'm really curious as to what they're going to do with it. Um, but at the end of the day, very much it's a, here is an event that happened in, in the actual Arthurian law. And, and now, how do you respond to that? And at least in the fifth edition one, you know, it's 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 very uh, it's very railroady because, and I don't mean that in a bad way. I just mean this is the legend that is taking place. You get to be kind of a part of it, but you never get to be one of the main players. You know, you never get to be Gawain or Lancelot or or any of those guys. You might be one of the other ones um, that they mention. That um, you know, the, the famous, the, you know, the, the relatively famous knights, but you never get up there with those other ones, no matter how good you are or amazing you are or any of that sort of stuff. And that was the big thing that that I that I thought about with Knight, is I thought, hang on, you know, the the players at my table, um, when we're gaming, you know, we want to be the main characters, but at the same time, we still want to be a part of this bigger, grander legend. So we still want other knights to be going around. Doesn't We don't really want it to be a game of of heroic fantasy in the in the same style of dnd is where you kind of feel like you're the only adventurers in town because you're the only ones dealing with any major problems going up right um and so we sort of so when i was thinking about this i just thought ah oh, you know it's such a great thing and it's and it's really nice to feel like you're a part of the legend but you never really get to be a player in the like a big player in the legend you know you might get to show up at king arthur's table and have a feast with him and even talk to him and that sort of stuff but you never get to say you know convince him to i don't know um I don't, I don't know. Kill Lancelot early before anything else happens. You know what I mean? Like that. that like that stuff is written in stone, and because it's written in stone, that's something that Knight moves away from differently. Because I don't actually use the actual King Arthur mythos, but but instead, what I do is I use the inspiration of the style, the romantic chivalry, um, but not actually the King Arthur legend. Then we get to tell our own grand stories and our own grand legends in many ways. So in our case, the king, or well, high queen, in my case, would be you know if you if you talk to her the right way, do the right things, you know, you might convince her to do something different. That, and it's not written in stone. Mm -hmm. So. So. Yeah. With that, with that in my, with that, with that in mind, um, you do make it. You do make a fair point because, as much as I love Pendragon, it is um, like a like a lot of like a lot of games that go that are in the historical leaning. It is married mm. to. It is a bit. It is a. I've I've used a term in the past called married to the setting. Yes. And yes. This is this is where a get this is where a given game is so its mechanics are so intrinsically tied to that particular setting that mm -hmm. while it's not impossible to put to to remove them, it is going to require a lot of work. Um, yes. A, yes. One of the big examples would be every single World of Darkness and entry <laughs> period, and and yep. I may yep. as well put in every everything that um, White Wolf put out. Um, yeah, yeah. Stuff like Shadowrun and Cyberpunk are also examples. I can't, I cannot picture a Shadowrun campaign not taking place in Seattle, and I cannot picture yeah, a, yeah. um, 
a cyberpunk game not taking place in Night City. I know that there's exp- yep. I know that over the years there's been expansions to accommodate that kind of thing, but nine times out of ten, if somebody's saying they're running a Shadowrun game, they're running it in Seattle or the or in a not in a nondescript place that's meant to be Seattle, you know, but not actually say it. Yeah, yeah. Um, I remember a um, a, a game of uh, Shadowrun that we played. We actually played it in Brisbane, which um, for for any non Australian viewers is our um, our local largest country town in um, in 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 one of our states here. And um, so um, you know, I mean, it, it, I don't know. It's just amusing to sort of come across your own. Um, uh, you know, bridges and, and places of interest and all that sort of stuff. And um, but I mean, that being said, though, by doing that, you know, we ignored a lot of the, um, you know, like the, there's there's time and effort and art and assets and and all of that sort of stuff built into Seattle. You know, they have all of that stuff there that um, you know it's really valuable to read it and understand it and know it. And if you set it outside of those places, then you kind of lose it uh you lose the feel of it a little bit um but that being said though what you gain is a personalized experience um and um you know at least talking about night especially as it's very much more collaborative um when we played the shadow run one it was much more sort of gm led which meant that the um, you know it was on the gm to sort of come up with absolutely everything but when there's the when there's this you know, shared experience, this collaborative experience, and you can build this your own city, then it kind of, you get so much more ownership over it. But, you know, with Seattle as such, you know, you, yeah, absolutely. You know, even even thinking about it now, and if I thought, if I would ever even contemplate rolling that many D6s ever again, um, or D10s, I should say, isn't it? Um, no, it's D6s, I think, for Shadowrun. Anyway, yeah, whatever it is. It is, it, it is D6s, ever, yeah. by the pound. It's yeah, D10 for wad. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, but if I ever could, con- could contemplate doing that, to um, ro- rolling that many D6s again, I would just automatically, straight away, go, oh, yeah, I'll be in Seattle, right? So, yeah. Mm-hmm. And, truth, and truth be told, um, I've, run sh- I've run Shadowrun and the like, and I've used... Uh, because that, because it's where everybody was from, I'd use the I'd used a heavily ve- heavily variant version of the of the Twin Cities where it was back to the old um it was back it was back to the old days of the two cities not getting along on anything. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. Um, uh, conflict is better. <laughs> well, <laughs> for, for 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 one, every, it's it's the one place. It I'm from Minnesota, and it's the one place every everybody knows. <laughs> mm, mm. You, yeah, it's true. Um, to the po- and it's it's to the point that it that um an easy way to sp- tell somebody's not from Minnesota is if they if they um refer to a place as Minneapolis or Saint or Saint Paul, whereas every, okay. whereas everybody else just co- just goes with the Twin Cities. Oh, really? See, I've never heard of it called that before. Um, but uh, other than I did hear one thing though. Um, is it true that you can actually get the smallest size of soda there? <laughs> I've never tr- I've never checked. Um, I have seen some I have seen some pretty some pretty small soda, but um, I'm not gonna. Sorry, I'm, a, I'm a dad. I'm a, I'm a dad. I just have to throw that one in there. You know, that's all right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I get. Yeah, now I now I get. It. I don't know why that went right through me. I think it's because I was in I was in game des- I was in game design mode and it just went past me. But. Um, yep, yep, yep. At the very, at the very least, I'll give you credit for not making jokes for not making jokes about la- about lakes or um or or anything like that because you know land of ten thousand lakes that's one of the big things people bring up. Um, oh, is it? Uh, is, oh, is that Great Lakes area? Is that where you're from? I've heard yeah. about that. Well, maybe, is that where they have all the alligators? Huh? Is that the alligators? Is that where they all no, come that's from? not. Anyway. That's that's <laughs> Florida. <laughs> No, oh, right, it, it's way t- it is way too cold for in- for anything like that to um, last. Oh right, okay. Cause... <laughs> Sorry, anyway, so some geographical um, but humor. Aside. The other big way to tell <laughs> to tell if somebody's not from around here is if is if if they know if they know what hot dish is. And anywhere Ooh. else in the world, it's casserole. In <laughs> in Minnesota, it is hot dish. <laughs> I don't make oh. the rules; I just follow them. Okay, so here's a question for you: If there's a, if you're, if you're having a hot dish, do you cook it in like a special 
hot dish dish, or do you call it a casserole dish like everywhere else? No, you just call it hot dish. Okay, so that also includes the actual crockery that you cook it in. Um, no, that's just you, that's just called crockery. But once once it's in once it's in the crockery and all and already being made or done, oh. then it becomes hot dish. When it's just a crockery on its own, oh. then call it what call it a crockery or whatever. Nobody cares. <laughs> oh right, okay. So we yeah we call the actual crockery a casserole dish. Yeah. So you know you you pull out your casserole dish and, mm -hmm. and cook a casserole yeah. in it. So there you go. I'm no I'm no stranger yeah. to I'm no stranger to Brisbane. Um, I could probably, oh. I could prop. I have, I have, I have friends all over the place. I'll put, I'll put it that way. And I, um, I, w I've joked that it's, I've joked that it's one of the places where the roads aren't trying to kill you. Yeah, that's true. Uh, because they're not that too job, bad here. The be people might, because <laughs> that job, because that job is, is monopolized by Sydney. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're not wrong. <laughs> like, uh, um, I do remember ranting right. for ranting for a bit when I found that um, sent the Central Australia time zone was split into two 30 minute time zones. Oh, really? I didn't even know that. And well, there we go. I because um doing the doing the show for five years has given me a lo a a particular loathing of time zones. <laughs> Nice. <laughs> and, uh, I could understand that. And because of that, um, the idea of deal of dealing with third there's some there's some weird parts in in Canada like St. John's that that work on fi work on like 15 minute have have an extra 15 minutes on the time zone for some godforsaken reason. And whenever mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I like to think I like to keep things simple. A time zone should have a one hour difference. That would make sense. Yeah, unfortunately, some people want to be unique. <laughs> uh, yes. And yeah. well, World of Cinnabar is a unique TTRPG, but you're not going to see anybody run it unless they're insane. Yeah, yeah. I haven't actually read it, but I've heard rumors about it. So um, uh, I have, yeah. I have read, I have read through it. I have tried to run it once, and that was enough for me to say I'm never doing that again. Um, oh, okay. It is, it is that, and a few other games from the from those eight, from those early di from those early days are the reason why I get triggered when I don't see proper navigation in books. Oh, did you get triggered by my book? <laughs> oh. <laughs> I have a contents page. I don't think I did any internet links, but it's only eighty-one pages long, so it's not too bad. That's if it's if it's of that if it's of that size. And from and from what I from what I've seen, it's not double column. Um, I no. don't I don't have a reason to to raise that much of a stink. Um, mm -hmm. It's when it's if you want if you want the big culprit, it's all it's always been every single book I've ever gotten from Palladium, um, Rifts especially Ooh. because that was Rifts the one I had the longest one because the yep. table of contents is full of lies and there's no index. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. I, I remember those days. It's been a fair few years since I've um, since I've looked at a Rifts book. To be honest, I don't, I don't even know if they're still making them. Uh, but, uh, yeah. Well, we as far as far as as far as core Rifts, they show they show up on occasion. Um, mm. um, but anytime I'm running Rifts these days, I'm using the Savage Worlds version. Oh yeah, well that makes sense. That's Which, a clean system. A clean system, and it's a and it's well. Savage Worlds was meant for pulpier kind of systems, anyway, so it's a natural fit. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. getting back on the rails, one of the other ones I found interesting that you brought up in that mini list is Into the Odd. Oh yes. Um, have you played it? Yeah. Or seen it? Read it? Yeah. So it's a um, it's a absolutely brilliant game, um, and in a couple of different reasons for that. Um, and the first reason for that is not inherently its mechanics, which are good, um, but um, my absolute inspiration. Chris McDowell is the author of it, and he is um, he is a master of technical writing. Um, and I well, when I read that into the odd. By itself, it's, it's rules. You know, you can you can go into the tables at the back, and there's a whole you know there's you know you can, there's dungeons and, and all the rest of it, right? But the rules take like 
I don't know, 10, 15 pages. And that includes absolutely everything and some extra options and, you know, um, oh, so you didn't want to roll on this table and you, so you can roll on the other table. But what you get at the end of that is this character that is clean, it is it is not statistically complicated, um, and is ready to go in a dungeon straight away. Is it a, is it a fully formed, uh, you know, role-playing experience? No. But what, when I was reading through Into the Odd, um, more than anything, he doesn't waste any words. Every word he uses is useful. And every, and, and more than one time in my life, I've been reading some role-playing book and my eyes blur and I skip stuff. But I didn't need to with this because he said what he needed to say and then he stopped, right? He didn't have to, and, and it made sense. And he didn't need to, he didn't repeat himself and um, that sort of stuff. And the more, I read that, and then I look back at these other role-playing books, and I'm not going to pick on any names like Shadowrun, but um, the uh, my, it is written in a way that obfuscates its meaning most of the time, um, or more than anything else, creates complexity that adds no value to the table, um, because, well, at least in my opinion, other people may love, um, you know, really complex games. And I certainly went through a time when I love simulationist games. But I don't love the concept of putting skills into things that are meaningless at the table, right? Um, and I don't love putting time into creating a character that um, the, the system fools you into thinking would be useful, but then when you play them is not what you asked for or not what you really wanted. Um, so if I want to, I mean, you know, I, I don't know. I love Shadowrun. You know, I, I love, I think, I, I remember there was a there was a, a YouTube lady at some point. I can't remember who she was, but um, she said, you, uh, Shadowrun players come in two, in two different types. They come with the, they come in the, we love Shadowrun and we play the rules because they're the rules and it's like this mark of, this badge of honour that we play these miserable rules that, um, that that are terrible. And then there's the Shadowrun players that love Shadowrun that use other rules to, to do the system, <laughs> to, um, to play the game better. Um, and I, I fall strongly into that second camp. I, I, I have no loyalty to those Shadowrun rules. Um, because they're just mechanics at the end of the day. And I just think this this concept of simple, technically correct, um, uh, efficient language that can teach a game and it does not feel that you have to, you know, go through this textbook of, of, um, of minutiae. You know, people can play into the odd. Um, and because I try to write night in the same way, people can play night. In the same way, you know, you don't, and, and fifth ed, if, if I pick on D&D for a little bit, um, you know, if I, I run a high school group for, I'm a teacher, so I run a high school group, and for a little while there, we did D&D, &D, and we'd, we'd go through the character classes and all the rest of that sort of stuff, and, the, you know, these these kids would be taken hours, and I, and I thought, they don't take hours because they... Um, don't care, but they take hours because they have no real context of the knowledge of the mechanics of this system. They don't want to make a bad choice. They want to make a good choice, and they just need time to sort of master that system. And one of the reasons that they're not mastering the system quickly is because the language, there, there are more words in that fifth edition book than what really need to be there, and that's what got me about Into the Yacht. I thought this guy writes in two sentences what something like like fifth edition D and D write in two pages, right? There's a lot of fluff. There's a lot of law uh, written into say the character creation section. Uh, there's there's heaps of fluff and law there, but they don't need that necessarily straight away. Not when they're making initial characters or, or whatever. And so I just go, oh wow, this technical writing is so precise, so excellent. Um, I knew how to play his game within 20 minutes, and that same game could could have characters just as complicated, just as interesting, just as focused, and they wouldn't be necessarily mechanically complex because there isn't such a thing as, I don't know, feats or class abilities or any of that sort of stuff. 
but they're just as interesting uh, role playing wise as what um, Jimmy the Elf is. Um, because some guy went, oh, you know, I want to be an elf ranger, and I picked this and I picked that, and now I'm an elf ranger, and it took me half an hour to do it. Into the Ode could have done it in five minutes, and you would have a character of equal story complexity, but mechanically is more complicated just because there's more stuff on the sheet. So, and so I went with this simplest style, this technical, this this simple technical language that is easy to understand, because so far everybody who's read my book is basically gone. Oh wow, that was quick, and 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 it does everything that you need it to do, rather. And into the odd did that for me because I went, wow, this guy writes in such a different way than what the majority of role playing books I've read uh, write like. Geez, I got onto a rant there. <laughs> no, that's what that's what we're here. That's what this place is here for. Um, besides, I can't really get I can't really get on you about a, about a rant when I've been ranting at how people look at. Um, cer- certain video game genres for years. Um, oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so so uh, the other thing is, it might might take through the the uh, some of the concepts, the mechanical concepts of Into the Odd, of just having three simple stats and um, and that sort of stuff. But it loses it 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 moves significantly away from that in many other ways. Um, but yeah, this this the um, I, I take that simple character concept mine is a bit more complicated than into the odd because into the odd games are generally speaking like a like, you know like a one shot or maybe a, a shortish campaign or something like that i haven't heard of people playing long campaigns with into the odd but hey maybe i just have never heard of it and they happen all the time mm-hmm. sorry about that i interrupted you no no worries go on i'm good i'm good let's right. keep going <laughs> so <laughs> The next, the next one that I'd want to ask on, and one that I am very familiar with, obviously, is um, Forged in the Dark. Yes, yes. Um, brilliant system. Um, John Harper. Uh, so I actually got into Forged in the Dark before I got into um, Into the Odd, um, even though I think Into the Odd has been around for much longer. I just hadn't picked it up for whatever reason. Um, and I remember um, there was some sort of uh, bundle of holding deal, um, and I got into Blades in the Dark that way. Like, uh, I think like five years earlier, a friend of mine was doing backflips about how cool it was, um, and I was right in the middle of an Ars Magica campaign, um, and so, and there's a there's a system of mechanical complexity for you, but um, it, the... Uh, I was right in the middle of that, of an extremely long, like, 10-year-long campaign, basically, like, real-world campaign mm-hmm. um, of that. So we weren't, you know, we weren't going to change campaigns until that one had, had properly finished up, right? So anyway, um, and then, so we forgot, we forgot about Blades in the Dark, and then I, I got it again. Um, I got a PDF, read the PDF, immediately went out and, and purchased the book um, because um, the PDF... In the bundle of holding cost me like i don't know um, that goes out to be like a dollar something and i thought oh john harper probably deserves more of my money for this um so i went out and bought his book um and um and it was great uh and uh and it did things in ways that i had never seen now it's interesting because i got into forged in the dark before i ever got into powered by the apocalypse games uh but powered by the apocalypse is where john harper his game sort of um you know much of the design background comes from that right anyway so um for the dark I'm, I'm i'm going through i'm seeing how he writes up his sort of his, his generalized stuff he, he absolutely blows my mind with how uh with more than anything his um his use of flashbacks and phases of play and and more more specifically for night how he integrates downtime as a extremely useful role-playing rich aspect of the game um and i hadn't seen that before um and so that's what blades in the dark um so he's got this and and i and something just 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 exploded in my brain at that point and i went hang on now um this guy's onto something um, he's he's got this great game. All right, you go you you thieves, you go you do your you do your heist, you come back, but then you've got to do this mechanical stuff. But it's not just mechanical. 
everything that you do in in the game as you as you know um sort of has this narrative aspect to it so even if i'm i don't know just trying to pick lock picks or something in my in my downtime then there's at least a few sentences that go on in the game about how how your character um lock picky mick lock pick is i don't know has like a wall full of random locks or something that that you that he sort of uh, picks so you know as a as practice or something like that and then just by that sentence of what i just came up with in this very moment suddenly that character has a background has uh, you know and we see this guy as like this focused character and i and i i really don't want to keep picking on dnd but you know i look at the downtime no, every, rules for everybody's other games. <laughs> everybody's equal in, ev we hold these truths to be self-evident that all are cremated equal <laughs> I don't want to pick on it specifically, but games just don't usually do D and D. Uh, don't they don't do D and D. They don't do downtime. And now, Ars Magica is another one. Now, I didn't list it there because Ars Magica is a very strong um, magical system, um, but it does downtime. Um, and this downtime that it does is in Ars Magica, at least. Um, so you don't. Well, you can, but you don't tend to earn experience points in Ars Magica by adventuring. Adventures are kind of interruptions to your wizard's life that they kind of have to do, otherwise bad things happen. But realistically, if you just want to be the, the biggest, toughest wizard out there, then you just kind of sit in your wizard's tower and, and study magic. And the way to get better at magic is actually to, to spend years studying magic. And, you, and so you go, oh, what do you do for this season? And so player A goes, oh, I'm studying fire magic. And, and uh, and 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 play a B goes. Oh, shouldn't we go and sort out that um, you know that that thieves guild and and then everyone has a bit of a chat about that and they're like, hey, you know, who cares about that? I'm a giant wizard. I could fireball all of them, you know. Like and so you've got this concept that this downtime is critically a part of what your characters want to do to improve themselves because every player really. You know, there's this there's this core part of us, you know, deep down inside that we all just want to get better at what we're doing, um, and and see our heroic characters get better at what they're doing. Um, we love to see those numbers go up, and um, so that that adventure play and downtime link together. And with Ars Magica, at least, you've got sort of this concept that you might go, oh, well, I go out to, to, to Area A to go and sort out an adventure there, which allows me to go and do open up more downtime options or something like that. Blades in the Dark reminded me of that and, and integrated it a lot better than what Ars Magica did mm -hmm. um, because, um, you know, it, it tells you directly that it is a narrative game. And that when you, uh, you know, are hitting up your contacts or something like that, you know, you should be describing what's going on and telling this the tale to the whole group as a as a movie or as a TV series or something like that. And so, by this combination of this blades in the dark downtime and what I'd done with Ars Magica for ten odd years or something like that, I'm like, you know what, uh, the concept of a of a level one peasant. You know, four weeks later, being the the hero of the realms, wearing their shiny gold plate, um, and 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 killing the evil dragon queen or whatever, it just doesn't. You know, like there's this there's this break um, in in the player's sense of versil uh, versimilitude. Versimilitude. There, there we go. There's the sucker. Um, there's this break, right? And that even if you're even if you're just there to roll the dice, and you're there to just kill some orcs, you know that it's it becomes more of a game and becomes less of a. Uh, and when I say game, I mean like board game on the table. It becomes more of a board game on the table and less of a story in the mind. And so. When I get this, when I do night, you know, I, I break it up by years, you know, like these nights take time to improve. Time passes, and that's one of the things that the majority of systems never do. They don't have time passing. Um, and this time passing linked with downtime together sort of create this larger tail, and that's what Blades in the Dark does, even though it never really talks about how much time should pass in those downtime you know you always got the feeling that it's at least like a at least a good few days or at least a week or two or, or something like that and so when this time passes it allows all of the other things going on because 
in that team, there's obviously those faction clocks and, and all of that stuff going on. Um, and it allows those things to move in the setting. Stuff around the players, unrelated to them, is moving. So they don't just feel that they're the main characters, but they also feel that they're in a living world because as time is happening, stuff is going on. But without those, uh, without those systems in play, then in a D&D game, you're always feeling like you're getting a curated, ex uh, you know, in most games, you're feeling like you're getting a curated experience and the GM just goes, you guys just hang out for two weeks and nothing else happens, but now we're moving on to this other part of the adventure. And you're like, but in Blades in the Dark, the other Forge games or whatever, you know, you got the feeling that your characters were doing stuff and now we're focusing back in on those action points again, those, those, those critical moments of choice that the players are after. Mm-hmm. I just went on another rant, didn't I? Jeez. Like you're, I just, said, you're just triggering me here. I'm just going strong. <laughs> uh, it's that's kind of, that's that kind of thing is something I always account for in the in these interviews. <laughs> nice. But given given what we mentioned earlier, I'm get I'm guessing that with Knight, there's uh, there's allusions to 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 some of the lore with 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 um with sh with the chivalric ideal and and the like, but it isn't putting its foot down as far as what this what setting it is, what uh, what um, time and hit what time in history it's supposed to be. It is more of a con it is more of a concept, less like a um, theme park and more like a sandbox. Yeah, except in this case, you'd be building your own sandbox. So um, I put the uh, I put the wooden rails up and I lay that sand flat. But um, people kind of bring their own toys to this well, um, to this metaphor. Um, there's, they, uh... there's two there's two schools of there's two schools of thought when it comes to this kind this kind of thing, and that is um, sandbox and theme park. Mm. Um, the idea with a sandbox is you are you are given you are you are given a, a set of tools and and ha and are given the freedom to make your own to make your own experience. A theme park, mm -hmm. well, in a theme park you have the very specific rides, but those ri but no matter how many times you go on the roller coaster, the roller coaster is going to have the same going to have the same experience, but there's different sync um there's different roller coasters all over the place. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's kind of what I mean by by sandbox and theme park, and the other analogy I often use with sandbox is um, the blue bucket of Legos we all had as kids. Yes. You know, just yep. a just a bucket of ra just a bucket of hundreds of random Legos with no instructions and be told figure it out. Yeah, well, I'm um, I'm I'm strong on that in this in this particular game. Um, so, if we're all putting our Legos in the sandpit, um, waiting for everybody's feet to stand on them. So the um, the big thing would be with night is that you know I, I, I give people a little starter adventure, I guess. But uh, the most important part of night is maybe I mean the questing is important. You know, you go out you. You lay low some some evil person and you come back, um, and then you you know you do some thief management and, and stuff like that. But that more than you're not looking at numbers in those cases. You're actually looking at the stories of people. Um, but then what happens is every player, including the GM, then when you uh, sorry I'll, I'll go back a little bit. When you create all your characters, you actually create the map of Avalon, and it's mostly blank other than your own people and where they live, and. After every quest, what happens is, um, in the fee phase, every player needs to now add something. And this could be a towel with trolls in it. Um, and another player later on, and this is why I quote Microscope, but another player might later on might go, hey, what's going on with that towel with trolls? And, um, and they might take over that towel with trolls story for that period and then add to it. So if we're going with a Legos, sort of concept it definitely is there's heaps of different legos and some kid might make one lego over there and then another kid might change it or update it or, or move it along so that every time you come back to it there's a new thing happening so um it, it is a sandbox but it's it's not a sandbox in that the in that the, the the gm has already created many of the elements it's a sandbox where the kid where the players are making their own elements and the gm is kind of 
um, curating the experience in terms of, of being like, well, where do you guys want to go next? And then they'll make it, and the players, and then those things that have happened have become a part of the law. So if that tower with trolls, for example, um, has uh, got, you know, has started to go out and raid the, and eat all of the people, then, and the players make the choice to go and deal with them, then it's the it's the player knights who chose that but then later on maybe someone will say oh but one of those trolls escaped and now absolutely hates the knights or something like that and those players are now making the choice now normally with a sandbox i always imagine that a, a, a gm comes up with a with a with an area and they they fill it with factions and stuff like that but what knight does differently significantly differently from most games is that with this map aspect with this creation aspect collaborative aspect all of the players are now playing adding controlling the factions but they don't feel necessary ownership over the factions specifically although i have actually seen players who get sort of tight about one faction or another mm -hmm. um but there's no there's no rule that says um uh, there's no rule that says that as soon as you create it, it's only yours to play with. In fact, as soon as it's on the map, it's anyone's to, to play with. So including whatever the GM has set up. So this collaborative aspect makes it a, a different experience and very different to, say, something like Pendragon, which has this rolling story of, of admittedly, epicness, amazingness. Mm -hmm. But it's a, a, it's a very different experience when you yourselves are the ones that, okay, so... I'm going to make this Tower of Trolls, says one player, and another player says, oh, okay, well, um, we're going to come up with a whole bunch of crusaders who want to go and, and, and murder all of the heathens. And you're like, oh, okay, fair enough. Well, how, how are now these new things going to come up? And player C comes up with something else, and now these three factions might all be in play. Um, and so after each quest phase, these things change and move on. And so, But it's the players doing them, not the GM sort of manipulating the background events it's the players outwardly openly manipulating the story so that we see all of the story pl taking place I, I, do you remember the old the, the old transformers cartoon and the um uh and the, and the symbol would sort of go in and out of the screen and flip over when it would show the other things yeah show the other side of the transformers right mm -hmm. so it was kind of like that um in that you know you'd play your knights and they'd do their thing and then and then the symbol would go over and now you'd see what some other people would be doing mm -hmm. except in this case i guess that symbol would be different heraldic shields but yeah i just thought of that i thought that was really amazing yeah. I should keep that metaphor. <laughs> <laughs> uh, now, ta taking it's it's funny you mention that because um, in the in this conversation, Ars Magic has been brought up, which mm. is the intent of some of Ars Magica is meant to be a passion play. This idea yeah. that you're not going to be you're not going to be con players are not going to be controlling just one character but rather controlling several as the story goes on and you're seeing the story from different avenues much in the same way as a play um having parallels so you're not following the exact same cast um all through throughout throughout every scene as opposed to say a mm -hmm. chamber play where ev where everything is the exact same cast set up usually in one room Yes, yes, absolutely. Uh, and given that, given that, is is there the implication that the that the even though the player characters are knights, they're they're members of of some order, or is that kind of thing optional? Um, okay, so I mean, if people play, uh, follow the main um, setup that I give them in the book, then uh, there is a uh, in the very in the very introduction sequence, then um, there is a, a mystical prophecy that happens, and basically this newborn baby is theirs, and they find out that she is the true queen of Avalon, um, and so they are asked to be united together in that. Yes, um, and so. The and I haven't actually had a single person burr up at that concept yet. So that as soon as there's basically as soon as there's like a you know a baby and it turns out that there's a bunch of like you know nasty people with knives who want to kill the baby, they're kind of like yeah we're not going to do we're not going to let that happen. You know we're knights. 
<laughs> and so they they kind of go along with that and because they this echoes the arthurian mythos fairly strongly um and it's but there's, there's there's like a million of the of the knights who were you know parents killed and you know raised by by other people or whatever and then find out their heritage later on um because it, it's got that they sort of want to go along with that um and so there is that uniting feature um, to bring them together. That being said, though, mm-hmm. um, there is an aspect of... Now, when I say player versus player, I, I don't mean direct. They're just going to kill each other, although that has fronted its head. Because of the nature of this collaborative play um, and the fact that they're different knightly houses, they're not the same knightly house. They're, they're not um, directly related to each other. So what happens is sometimes this puts them in conflict with each other, um, even though they have this unifying bond. Um, and to be honest, it's actually been really interesting because the the, the things that separate them um, can sometimes um, mean that at the table strong things happen, you know, interesting things happen at the table. Uh, for example, we had a um, uh, one player um, in the thief phase. It turned out that his um, his sister was a uh, had gone on a raid, and that raid had hit another player character's lands, and that and in doing so, um, had killed one of that player character's um, uh, family members. And so, the these two knights faced off against each other, even though they have this this bond of knowing that if they don't help the true queen succeed and protect her from the from the multitude of threats but they still have these personal issues that they have to deal with each other have to um focus on you know to the point that that uh, they they were almost ready to um uh, to to fight each other and this is something that in my games you know i never focus on player versus player mm-hmm. character stuff mm-hmm. but it gives them a legitimate reason for conflict occasionally there is space for conflict to happen and space for that conflict to be negotiated out rather than necessarily a conflict equals violence to the death between these people right so um so with these with these players they they sort of had to very carefully um walk around each other and and look for other opportunities to not engage in violence with each other um and maybe they did that because they were both players at the same table um but that being said the game also knows that um and as you say a passion play there's many different focuses that that show up in this um and the different family members of the knightly houses have have a little time in the sun um and it, but it always comes back to the knights and how they're interacting with each other and that sort of stuff. So we had, uh, and because it is generational, after you've done a, about 10 adventures or so, all of your main knights retire, you have a time skip, and then it's their heirs who all get to, to play with each other. Yeah. So at one point, one knight died, um, and well, he didn't die, actually. He was... He was um, uh, basically, there was two knights that were in, in strife, and another knight refused to attempt to rescue him because um he just didn't like the knight um and it, it this comes out later on at a feast but it's only at the at the airs when they mention this that this conflict starts to come up but what we get then is this um this and now it doesn't it didn't end up in violence between the characters but what we get is this acrimony between not the players but the characters in the you know in this passion play if you want to call it that this acrimony between them that goes yes we want to do this thing for the high queen but geez you know we've got these personal problems and then we've that then you've got this sort of samurai like choice and geez knights and samurai are similar between duty and uh, you know uh, this higher duty and personal feeling um, about what's going to go on. And so it just adds this um, this element. And to be honest, most of this stuff is all completely created by the characters. The players in my games are almost never protective of themselves. They almost always put themselves in the worst possible positions they can, which is great because all it does is creates heaps of drama. Mm-hmm. And rules are meant to add drama. I, re- I remember that mantra being <laughs> passed around a lot with some of the design circles I was in, and I like, keep- I like keeping it. Now, as I understand mm-hmm. it, you're using 
D, you're using D20 roll under for for one, which I'm, pers yeah. I'm personally uh, I actually I actually prefer because it me because it me it's it and it allows for a degree of um, future proofing as yep. well as well yep. as not as well as not having to worry about what the difficulty is all that much. You've got a bit. In a roll high, you have to you have to assess what's the di what the um, skit what the difficulty is going to be and skit and scale it as people get better. But in a roll under, um, that job's are that half of that job's already taken care of for you. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. I um I I came across roll under systems um a while back with stuff like the black hack and um and those sorts of things, but um and they're uh, they're great games. They do they do what they do well. And um but more than anything, um what I found, especially playing with kids and and even playing with myself, uh, playing with my own personal game, I should say, the um stuff where I'm adding modifiers. Uh, slows the game. Even if any time I have to add a modifier and check it against something else, this slows the game down. If I can roll a dice, and I think playing Black Hack or um, or something like that, and I and you just you roll under and you know whether you succeeded or failed, right? And it, it is very clear. There is no real there. There is no extra part of this, and. Um, I remember playing the um, the Star Wars Genesis system, and um, it's a uh, it's really um, a, well. I have my problems with it because of its average rolls actually being a failure. Um, the I um, know oh being a, a uh, yeah. Anyway, what my big problem with that was is you've got a dice pool on one side and a dice pool on the other side, and you've kind of got to do some maths at the table, and then the moment that that happens. There's this sort of three, four, five second break where people are doing these calculations, and and any time there's dead space at the table, uh, you know yourself, you run a podcast, you know you don't really want a lot of dead space, right? Because that loses interest. Um, and um, if there is this dead space at the table, that means players disengage, and that's when people start to take out their phones or, or any of that sort of stuff. But if everybody rolls, and then you just know what it is. And you're paying attention to the story. There, there's there's no sort of moving between the the the, uh, the story itself and the and the mechanics of the game too much. And so the more the more mechanical backflips that people have to do, the more it becomes this game very much focused on the dice rolls and the numbers. Um, there's a famous uh, you know and and uh, there's a famous song by an Australian band called Tripod about Dungeons and Dragons, and it basically has this line where it's like, and that's when the numbers got really exciting. Um, the, the, um, the, the focus is at least, at least with night and, and even the way that I run, uh, run more, more standard dungeon crawls or any of that sort of stuff, the, the focus should be on the, the choices of the characters about what they do and, uh, and then quickly resolving to see how it fares out a slow resolution just uh, you know, I, I know those those few times that I'm a player, I'm just um, I'm I'm just I'm just melting into the table, waiting for other people to do the maths. <laughs> so I really wanted to be quick, as quick as I possibly could, mm -hmm. and that roll under system is that. Um, and if we move on to something like Trophy Dark or or some or Cthulhu Dark or something like that, those systems are really great, and I love them in many ways. But they but they are um, they require a lot of storytelling now. Um, from players, and they don't always have that. I've got a player who just who just um, who, who believes he's not creative, and uh, I don't agree with him. But he believes he's not creative, and that creative things exhaust him. And I can see that they do that. So when he's playing, I can see the fatigue. And when he's playing a story game, I can see the fatigue wearing on him of of being forced to come up with things and, and the expectation that they need to be of a certain standard or something like that. And so this combination of of the effect die and um, and and roll under die, I thought, well, you know, I'm leaving a middle ground here. I'm giving people enough to play with that they can tell their version of the story. Um, and uh, and it's done, and it's also done quickly in a more OSR style. Um, that that you know you can get round, uh, you can do a whole round of combat in in this roll under system so quickly. Um, whereas in in, in 
you know, I can always pick on D&D, I guess, but, uh, you know, don't it's going to be... You apologize just, for picking it's... on D&D. I told you, everybody's, <laughs> oh, man, I do. I everybody's do. a target. <laughs> I, you know, I love D&D for what it does. I really do. I'm not, I'm not that bad about it. But it's going to be 15 minutes or 20 minutes before you get your, um, uh, before you get a go again, right? So you have your turn, and there's going to be another 15 minutes before you get a go. I don't want to sit there doing nothing for 15 minutes um, while other people do some maths. Mm-hmm. Understa- understandable. So with within that... Um... Given the fact that every, given the fact that everyone is, everyone playing is going to be a knight, um, mm-hmm. I think the, I think the next, the next logical thing to ask is, is, um, is there, is when it, when they're creating their knight, is there still going to be a degree of, um, fl- a degree of flexibility in terms of what, in terms of how that knight can, can manifest, both in terms of mechanics and well, obviously, in terms of narrative. So. Yes. Um, so the answer is yes. Um, there's a mechanical uh, concept called traits. Um, you can, and, and basically what they do, now, knights are, are generally speaking, well-rounded, skilled people, especially the romantic chivalric knights that we're talking about, mm-hmm. um, rather than realistic knights as such. Um, but, you know, they're, they're skilled at everything. So, they, you know, they're good at combat, they're, they're, they're trained in etiquette and, and all the rest of those things. They know all the standard dances. You know, that's just the assumption that, that the knight will have. You know, you never get to, you never have to worry about that. Um, those traits are the things that make you excel in a certain field. So everybody can go jousting. Um, there's no limitation on that. But if you pick the if you pick um, a trait, the lancer trait, then you'll be really good at that and the mechanics will... Um, be boosted for you when you're attempting those abilities um when those those styles of things now it is a little bit broad so if we say lancer for instance then a lancer would be really good at obviously um jousting but also in the battlefield when they're doing um uh, when they're leading when when they're um doing cavalry maneuvers or or even things like um or riding around uh, you know riding horses that sort of stuff you know i'm really open and flexible with that sort of stuff um but on the other hand um if they took a a trait like a tawny knight for instance then whenever they're in a tournament then they'll have heaps and heaps of bonuses but outside of that tournament situation um, then they're just a standard knight so um, so they might be able to face up to a fencer in a tournament. Or they might be able to face up to a skillful swordsman in a tournament, but in a real battle, that's when they might get cut down. Um, and so that's what the that's what the traits do. Every character has at least one to start with, and um, the traits are created. I have a list at the start, but it, but it says choose. Um, you can roll on it. You can choose one. Well, you can just flat out make your own. Um, they're not supposed to be, uh, um, you know, these are the only ones available, you know, and there's stuff like Lawmaster if you want to be something like a more of a, you know, a knight with arcane knowledge or, or things like that, or a, or a spy master or, or something like that, if you want to be more of a rogue, those things are available. Um, and those traits will distinctly um, adjust your adjust you mechanically, and they will also adjust your you narratively. So if you are a courtier, um, then it would just be it would be assumed uh, that you would have not just standard nice clothes mm-hmm. but you'd have the really nice clothes does that make sense yeah. um the really nice clothes to let you sit in 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 a king's court somewhere if you have courtier you don't yeah like everyone has nice clothes you're the one with the really cool ones mm-hmm. because you've got that trait yeah um now when it comes to the luck when it comes to the luck die um, what prompted that? What prompted that being put in? Oh, um, so the luck die came from another thing by John Harper. Actually, he did. Um, well, what was it called? Uh, it's like a Dungeon World 1979 um, thing. I can't remember the exact name. Uh, World of Dungeons or something like that. Um, and it was an extremely lightweight system. It's on like two pages. Um, and it has a luck die mechanic in it, which I stole. Now, originally when I was playing the game, I had no idea how to use it. And, um, and I don't, to be honest, Knight doesn't give a whole lot of guidance for it either, because when I'm watching other people play the game in their own way, everyone uses it in a different way. 
Um, and if they're using it in the way that suits them, then great. You know, they're doing the thing every, you know, as soon as, as, soon as knife is in their hands, it's their game to go and play with in, in whatever way. Mm -hmm. But where did it come from originally was this. In the, um, in the thief phase, uh, oh, well, the very first time that I used it, um, a knight basically got splattered by a, um, by a great axe to the head. And, uh, well, it was described that they were attacked um, and they were defeated and they they didn't know how bad it was going to be and they just say roll a luck die to see how bad it's going to be because you might you might survive you know um, and it might be fine you might just be KO'd because they're accidents your helmet or um, or you could be killed or you could be maimed or whatever you might want to do and so we rolled the die and they and it, and it got, turned out to be a two and they ended up being horribly their, their facial features horribly maimed for the rest of their life um, and so that just and that became a, a new trait actually that was written onto their character sheet and it was just basically like maimed you know like it was like a um, their, their skull got caved in or something like that you know it was very obvious and and so what happens with that luck die is that I use it in combination with other mechanics. If I don't want to make a straight decision on a thing, mm -hmm. um, and for whatever reason, and sometimes, you know what, players, um, they they might feel that, I'm not, I'm not worried, my players trust me, but they might, pre I think that they prefer the concept that you know they could die on a, if they roll really badly on that luck die but when they're defeated but if other things might happen they're really open to that and and the range on the dice just one to six will just say how bad it is you know if you if you just get like knocked over and forgotten and you roll over a six you know you roll a six you get knocked over and you're and you're out for a minute um and then you get back up again um they're, they're going to be just as happy with that but if they roll a one, and I always make them roll the dice um, if it's a personal combat or something like that, because then they know it's their own sort of thing. If I just chose to say, you're on zero endurance, you you die because this guy knifes you when you're down or something, um, then, I don't know, this randomness adds to the story, because I didn't know it was going to go in that way. They didn't know it was going to go in that way, and we're all going to work out how it goes there. That guy who got horribly maimed, had a really interesting character and i would never have picked that because i don't necessarily think of of facial maiming i think he rolled a two or something and then i asked him what happened um and i just said look it's going to be pretty bad what what do you think it is um and so i've had quite a lot of people lose arms and legs and all sorts of stuff for from their characters because of that rolling of the luck die now the other thing that i do with the luck die especially in the thief phase mm -hmm is I've got this thing called the event table where um, it's it's basically just a table of inspiration and it's got words on it that, that evoke um, romantic chivalric stuff and they roll on that and they get a word and then if they haven't got something that they want to already say because half the time people already have this idea sometimes from the word sometimes before the word the the inspiring word shows up and if they haven't got something and they're looking a bit blank I just go, well, roll a luck die to see whether it's good or bad. And and if it's in the middle, it's interesting. Um, and so they roll, and if it's good, they're like, oh, here we go. Um, and I rolled uh, I don't know, a merchant, and it's really good. And I go, oh, well, okay. Um, what do you think happens? And then they go in from there. But if they were, I use the luck die to sort of get past that analysis paralysis moment of them having a story idea and them choking and I go because then it gives them another little push to go good or bad or just like funny or interesting or, or something like that. Mm -hmm. Now, with that with that in mind, one of the other th one of the other things I was I was curious about is the in the I did no I did notice that when it when I was looking through the preview that it's that the history of Avalon, you never, you, I'm guessing because of the fact that people are creating their own Avalon each time they set up a campaign, but you never, but mm. you list events, but not necessarily dates. Yes. Yep. Um, there, there is one date in there, which is 379, um, which is basically the date when it, when it happens. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't put in specific dates because honestly, its relevance to realistic play is. Um, 
unimportant and can be quickly established in game right if i say you know this happened specifically 20 years ago yeah you know whether it happened that or the next time i, I talk about it i say 15 years ago you know we know that it happened in the past it was the previous generation or something like that um and and the way that i that i write up the um the history of avalon as such is you know you you've clearly got the distant past and the middle past and the recent past and and here you are you know, like that's all you really need to know because that's pretty much what your characters would kind of know. You know, there's there's stuff they don't know how long ago it was, um, but they know that it was a very long time ago. Mm -hmm. um, although, admittedly, the knights are literate. Originally, in the first few editions of this game, I had the um, I had the knights illiterate unless they were um, uh, had the lore master thing. But I just had enough players who just desperately wanted to read and write that. Um, um, and I thought, oh, well, fair enough, you know, just make them really cool, and, and they read and write, and that's all. But it, it, it used to be a lot more historically focused and based, um, whereas now it's, it's much more collaborative in, in the way that it goes about. Does that answer your question? Mm -hmm. Although, personally, that does, but personally, when it comes to the right, when it comes to the reading-write issue, um, the approach I've always taken is there's... There's a certain reading and writing method that's un that's universe that's um, universally accepted, mm. but every but but everybody has their own has their own little variants that you need to be in the know about. You know, kind kind mm. of kind of like how even if you even if you know how to speak a certain language, um, things can can get further complicated with how that language is transformed by just local dialects. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And well, look, look at how, look at how, say, American English um, tra was, was, shit, was there was so much change between that and I'll just use Victorian English to the to the point where they may as well be two different. Yeah, you got ruined English. You, you're really bad at it. Hmm? <laughs> sorry, <laughs> sorry. That's a bit of uh, Australian banter for you. I'm sorry. Yeah. I was just, I was just picking on yeah. Americanisms. That's all right. Um, <laughs> I have heard, the only re the only reason I can't is because I, is because I've heard what I've heard people speak um, Welsh and have and have to ask them to repeat themselves because a dear friend of mine has a thick accent and talks fast. The unholy. Oh, really? The oh. unholy combination. Um, oh dear. <laughs> and when when I say talks fast, I don't I don't mean I don't mean with a with a slightly faster um, to tone. No, I mean think of an auctioneer kind of fast. <laughs> oh wow! Okay, geez, I can barely understand auctioneers when they speak it uh, in, in in my own dialect. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, I usually if usually if I have to use a frame of reference, I'll use either auctioneers or the micro machines guy. <laughs> Although that's a little bit unfair because he's the Guinness holder for the fastest talker. I love it. I love it. Yeah. But oh, nice. when it comes now with that with that in with that in mind, um I do think I am cur I do appreciate that in the um preview document you have a you have a um a setup for a set a setup for um a full for a full on module, but one thing I'm curious about is um in the full document do you have plans for something akin to story seeds, little events or rumors that you could possibly build an adventure around? Um, I did actually originally, and um, I, I wrote up a. Um, it probably would have been an extra twenty page of, of material or so, and they they hang around somewhere, but um, I wrote them all up. And I looked at them carefully, and I really thought to myself. And I, in in my campaign, there's three different ages, and they have a sort of a different technological feel, you know. And, and that, that's the thing I just stole straight out of Pendragon. Um, and when I when I did that stuff, I I looked at it and I went, I have here ten seeds for every single thing, and I. Um, and I thought to myself really clearly, hang on, am I taking away from the other people's enjoyment of the game because they will be guided thinking that because I'm the author of a game that maybe I know something more than they do and, and I don't know more than they do 
especially about their groups and the things that they that their groups might want to do and the moment and, and i thought hang on i think what i'm going to be doing is is either i'm going to be forcing characters to play basically the great the king arthur pendragon campaign in my own way or um or wasting wasting pages because they'll look at them ignore them and play their own game and i thought well i didn't really want to do either of those things because if i if i put in you know uh, 30 story seeds for things in there there's 30 adventures that they that they can do um Am I taking away from the fact that the players will be creating all of their own little story things and the GM will be pushing, 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 pushing towards these story seeds that I've got? And I, and I wanted to, to not do that, to basically go, no, no, I really want you guys to, to play your own story, make your own story, because, you know, when I, when I run a, a, an adventure of night, it doesn't actually take very long. You know, that, that one Tower of Trolls that I, that I keep talking about, that's, that's one adventure. And that one adventure might take you only two hours to do, um, or, you know, one and a half, two hours to play, and then it's done. And, you know, if I put in Tower of Trolls as one of the things, is is the GM or whoever going to be like, oh, now we need to put in the Tower of Trolls? And I'm like, no, I, I just, I, I want people to run their own game, because if someone wants to crash a spaceship into Avalon, you know, I, I don't... I never in any way say, no, no, you can't interest, uh, you know, put in sci-fi elements. If people want sci-fi elements in their Arthurian uh, play and their, and all of the players are happy with it, you know, have fun with your with your um, knights in mech suits and laser swords. That's It's fine. Mm -hmm. now, I, will, I will certainly be looking forward to seeing how, to seeing how it develops. Uh, especially, especially since um, hacking hacking the system is go is going to be inevitable. Some of, some of the be some of the yeah. best stuff I've seen has come out of hacks, and well, um, that's how we got that sort of hackery is how we got Rollmaster. <laughs> yeah, well, and and my game is a hack of, of like three other games mixed together. So <laughs> um, hacking is uh, is is how we create. So with with all that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come all the way to my temple and enjoy the madness that happens here. Oh, I I, I love worshiping at the Tower of Gaming. Mm -hmm. And anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> Lovely. Thank you so much for your time. Mm -hmm. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty, everybody! <laughs>